Hello and thanks for watching. This video is about the Acts 28 Dispensational Frontier. If you would open in your Bible to the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 28. I'm going to be beginning in chapter 28, verse 23. Acts 28, 23. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Esaias, the prophet, unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you, that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed, and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God, and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ, with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Now this video refers to the Acts 28 Dispensational Frontier. Now that's a mouthful, so we need to talk about what we mean when we talk about, first of all, a dispensation, and secondly, a frontier. It is our contention that the close of the book of Acts, the close and end of the book of the Acts of the Apostles, marks an important turning point in the history of God's economy towards mankind. Now, dispensation Defined by Webster's Dictionary, this is the 1913 edition. A dispensation, the act of dispensing or dealing out. Distribution, often used of the distribution of goods and e good and evil by God to man, or more generically, of the acts and modes of his administration. Second definition, that which is dispensed, dealt out, or appointed, that which is enjoined or bestowed, especially a system of principles, promises, and rules ordained and administered. Scheme, economy, as the patriarchal, mosaic, and Christian dispensations. Now, the two words that I think really come to mind and, and really nail down what a dispensation is from a biblical perspective are administration and economy. When we speak about a dispensation in the Bible, we're speaking about a manner of God's administration to his people or the way that he is stewarding uh, things within his household economy. So, for example, the way that God dealt with Adam and Eve in the garden before the fall is different than the way that God will deal with mankind during the millennium. Or, the way that God deals with his people today in the dispensation of grace is different than the way that he dealt with the children of Israel when they wandered in the wilderness. It's important to mark these divisions and rightly divide them as the Apostle Paul instructs us to do. For it is only when we accurately appropriate the words of God and apply them to the people to whom they were addressed in the context with which they were written that we can make sense of the whole of the Word of God. If we go through the book of Romans or we go through the book of Ephesians, or if we go through any of the Bible, and take pieces that don't belong to us and apply them directly, or claim promises that were never made to us, we will only get confusion out of God's book. Now at the outset we have to say, first of all, that we believe that all of the Bible is given by inspiration, that it is all inspired. That there isn't any section of the Bible that is more inspired than the other. That is not what we mean by rightly dividing or recognizing dispensations. It is also not our contention that certain books are uh, 
more applicable in the sense of their doctrinal content. We have to make a distinction between doctrinal truths and dispensational truths. For example, the book of Romans speaks about justification by faith alone. This is true throughout the whole of God's creation. Justification by faith alone is not a dispensational truth. Now there are many today who would dispute this and say that in the Old Testament that God's people were saved by a combination of faith and works. But any cursory understanding of the distinction between grace and works rules out such a conclusion. So we need to make it very clear that when we talk about dispensations in general and God's economy or God's administrations throughout time, we're not talking about differences within the nature of God or differences within doctrinal, uh, foundational doctrinal content like justification by faith alone or the Trinity or any of these other uh, things that are innate to the nature of God himself and not to his dispensing towards his people. So that's what a dispensation is. But what do we mean by a dispensational boundary? Well, it is our contention here today to show that at the close of the book of Acts, there was a great crossing over from one dispensation to another. That throughout the book of Acts and throughout the Lord's earthly ministry during the four Gospels, he was dealing primarily with the nation of Israel, with the nation of Israel's hope, New Covenant, the New Jerusalem, according to the prophets. And that those hopes and standings, and those hopes and promises, and that dispensation, and that New Covenant, were all in view as long as the nation of Israel stood before God as a people. I want to quote a dispensational theologian from the 19th century named Charles McIntosh, who in his commentary on the verses that we just read in Acts 28 said, quote, So long as Israel could be regarded as the object of testimony, so long the testimony continued. But when they were shut up to judicial blindness, they ceased to come within the range of testimony, wherefore the testimony ceased. And so we must get it through our heads that as long as the nation of Israel stood before God, all of the promises, all of the hopes, and all of the prophecies concerning that nation were still in view. It's important to remember that the Lord Jesus Christ came to the Jew first, and that he was sent not to the world at large at first at his, in his earthly ministry, but he was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This preeminence of the nation of Israel is a distinction held throughout most of the scriptures. And it's a distinction that did not end with the conversion of the Apostle Paul. To establish this, to establish that the Jew being first and the nation of Israel existing as a nation before God throughout the entirety of the book of Acts, we will have to start in the four Gospels to get an idea of what we're talking about. Let's turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10. It's going to be Matthew 10, beginning in verse 5. Actually, we could probably back it up a little bit earlier than that. Let's go chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. Matthew 10, verse 1. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples... He gave them power against unclean spirits, to cast them out, and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus, and Labaius, whose surname was Thaddeus. Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve... Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but rather, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This continued throughout the book of Matthew. If we go to Matthew chapter 15, in verse 24, we can see 
Christ echoing the same sentiment when he said, but he answered and said, quote, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So understand that Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry was sent to the circumcision. He was sent to the nation of Israel. He was not sent, as we are sent today, to all nations equally, offering the message of salvation in faith, uh, putting our faith in what Christ accomplished on the cross. Nobody at this time, none of the apostles at this time, or the disciples, grasped the import of the message of the cross. And certainly, they were not under the pretense that the Gentiles were going to be part of this joint church where there's neither Jew and Gentile and everybody's all one. That was something that was not understood at the time of the four Gospels, and it wouldn't be revealed until much, much later. This idea of the Jew first, this idea of the uh, Israel having the preeminence, is of course part of God's revealed program. The New Covenant, indeed, was to make Israel the channel of blessing through which the Gentiles would be blessed. Let's go to uh, the book of Luke. Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Luke 24, in verse 47. 46. We'll start in Luke 24, 46. And said unto them, Thus it is written, And thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So following the Lord's death, burial, resurrection, he's commanding now that the repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, but beginning at Jerusalem. It's to the Jew first. This continues into the book of Acts. Let's go to Acts chapter 3. Peter speaking here. Acts 3.25 Ye are the children of the prophets, he's addressing Jews, and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed, unto you first. God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. So this message again, going to the Jew first the children of the prophets. The nation of Israel held a favored position before God, even into the book of Acts. This is in Acts chapter 3 now. So far from everything being switched over to uh, complete equality in Acts chapter 2, we have clear evidence that in Acts chapter 3 there is still uh, this division. Let's go forward now to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. This is the Apostle Paul, the Apostle to the Gentiles speaking now. Acts chapter 13, verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. It's talking to Jews again. But seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So this is a localized example where in this city, Paul and Barnabas are preaching to the Jews, they don't accept it, so he turns to the Gentiles. And this would be the pattern throughout the book of Acts of the Apostle Paul, going to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. Why was he doing this? Well, he makes it very clear in Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, beginning in verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Why does he magnify his office? Why is he boasting in his office of being the apostle of the Gentiles? If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. So the preaching and the salvation being sent to the Gentiles in the book of Romans, which was written during the book of Acts, the purpose for that is to provoke the Jew, to, uh, to provoke them to jealousy, so that they might believe. 
He goes on, For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, this is unbelieving Jews now, and thou, Gentiles, being a wild olive tree, wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. So remember, this is Gentiles being grafted into an existing olive tree. That's the covenant privileges of the nation of Israel. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Gentiles might say, well, the Jews fell so that we could get everything. Paul says that's not the case. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell. Severity, but toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in. For if thou wert cut off of the olive, cut of, out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature. That's the standing of Gentiles in the book of Acts. They're wild by nature. They don't belong in the olive tree. They were grafted in contrary to nature into a good olive tree. How much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So the promises were given to the Jews. The new covenant was for the Jews. Christ came to the nation of Israel. He's the king of the Jews. He will reign in his millennial kingdom in Jerusalem over a Jewish kingdom. That is the channel of blessing that will bless the Gentiles, the other nations, in the consummation of God's revealed program. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Sion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. So notice that during the book of Acts, the salvation of God was sent to the Gentiles, but for the express purpose of provoking the unbelieving Jews to jealousy, to cause them to repent. For the fulfillment of the new covenant was dependent upon the repentance of Israel. Let's go to Jeremiah 31 to read about the new covenant. Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Note, the new covenant was made expressly with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. The nation of Israel, repenting, the nation of Israel in belief, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Now, anyone who tells you that the new covenant has been completed and that it is in fully in effect today doesn't know what they're talking about, do they? All shall, they shall all know me. Do all know the Lord? From the least of them to the greatest of them? No. Is the nation of Israel repenting and believing? No. For at the close of the book of Acts, they were dismissed and counted in blindness for the last time. It was only then that salvation could be sent to the Gentiles alike. Without the Jew being first, without any reference 
to blessings with Abraham or the Abrahamic covenant or the new covenant. Let's go to Acts 28.20. Just to take a look at Paul's attitude, uh, even in this late stage of the book of Acts. Many will say it's becoming increasingly popular to believe that this current dispensation began with the conversion of the Apostle Paul. But when you read the book of Acts and you see all the things that the Apostle Paul did that were in line with the previous dispensation, you understand that that could not be. And you understand that the keystone to recognizing the dispensational change is the status of the nation of Israel. And it is only here, and by process, this could be proven by the positive evidence and by process of elimination through the negative evidence, that it is only at the close of the book of Acts that we can say that the dispensational change occurred. Acts 28, verse 20. For this cause, therefore, I called you, to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. So we have even in this late stage that the Apostle Paul's hope was the hope of Israel. What was the hope of Israel? Well, let's go and take a look at Acts chapter 1. We'll go clear across to the other side and take a look here. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The Lord Jesus Christ here gives the order. It's Jerusalem first, and then Judea, then Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Salvation to the Jew first, conversion of Jerusalem, and then outward to the other nations. Israel had the preeminence. Notice, in verse 6, when, he, when they therefore. What's the wherefore of that therefore? Well, if you read in verse 3, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. The Lord Jesus Christ, speaking to his apostles, the things that pertain to the kingdom of God for forty days assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore, as a result of talking to the Lord Jesus Christ for forty days about the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, they asked him, Wilt thou this time restore again the kingdom to Israel. The twelve apostles' hope was the re restoration of the kingdom. This continued clear out through the book of Acts. Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 3. Acts 3.19 Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. This is the great hope of the nation of Israel, and it is the great hope in God's revealed program for the world at large. The Gentiles will be blessed through the re a repentant and believing nation of Israel ruled by the Lord Jesus Christ, God incarnate, on the throne in Jerusalem, the throne of David. This is the hope of Israel. This is the hope that the twelve apostles had in mind. And this is the hope that even our Apostle Paul, the Apostle to the Gentiles, held, had in mind. This hope was in play for as long as the nation of Israel stood before God. 
how can we prove that there was no dispensational change prior to this? Well, what was another marked uh, characteristic of the dispensation of the Book of Acts? Signs and wonders, miraculous signs. Let's take a look at the book of Mark. In the last chapter, Mark 16. Mark 16, chapter, <laughs> Mark chapter 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. This is at the close of the book of Mark. Let's go now back to the 28th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 28, verse 3. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of, his, out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked... When he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. What was that about handling serpents? The Apostle Paul had the sign gifts in Acts chapter 28. So it strains credulity to say that the dispensational change began with the stoning of Stephen or began with Paul's conversion. When in Acts chapter 28, the hope of Israel is there, the signs are there, the new covenant is in play, as we'll see when we look at his epistle to the Corinthians. The new Jerusalem was the mother of them all. The second coming, the Lord's imminent return was still in play. All of these things pertain to the nation of Israel and that dispensation which was prominent throughout the book of Acts. It is one dispensation. It is not a transitional period. It is not... Uh, the story of the birth of the church. It is none of those things, but it is the story of how the nation of Israel rejected the testimony of the Holy Spirit and the testimony of the Holy Ghost through the Twelve Apostles and the Apostle of the Gentiles, the Apostle Paul. And that is why, in the closing of the book of Acts, the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles in a way not like before, for the Jews were departed. Notice, and when they had appointed him a day, this is in 28:23, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till even. That's how you preach to the Jews, and that's how these things were preached in the book of Acts. Everything was in accordance with the law and the prophets. The dispensation of the grace of God revealed to the Apostle Paul following the close of the book of Acts. In the prison epistles, in those two great epistles, Ephesians and Colossians, was a mystery. You couldn't search it out in the prophets. You couldn't search it out in Moses. It wasn't there. It's not part of the revealed program. It's part of God's mystery program, which has been in operation for 2,000 years. But how many people know about it? Oh, that the church would have heeded the call to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. How many men see what is the fellowship of the mystery? How many could even tell you what it is? But regardless, we see the sign gifts still in play here. If we look in, uh, in 28, chapter 28, verse 8, it came to pass that the Father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. 
So laying hands on people, healing people, handling serpents and not being hurt, these are the very things that were promised that would follow them that believed in Mark chapter 16. The Lord Jesus Christ said these things would happen. They did happen, but they don't happen today. And the reason they don't happen today isn't because the Bible's a lie, and it isn't because you're not engendering enough faith in yourself to handle serpents. The reason it happened, and the reason it doesn't happen today, is because there's been a transition, there's been a dispensational boundary that has been crossed. The nation of Israel is not God's people today. They are not counted as God's favorite channel of blessing. The revealed program of God, which was dependent upon the repentance of Israel and the fulfillment of the new covenant, was suspended. And it is only after that the, the, the message is rejected that the mystery is then revealed. And that mystery we will now get to. Let's go to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes far, were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Out of Jew and Gentile, in Christ, now, at the time of the writing of the book of Ephesians, which is following the close of the book of Acts, God has made one new man. And he did this, and was able to do this, by the work that he did on the cross. But the one new man wasn't created at the cross, or certainly wasn't revealed at the time of the crucifixion. It wasn't revealed at the time of the resurrection. It wasn't revealed at the time of the ascension. It wasn't revealed at the time of Pentecost. It wasn't revealed at the time of the stoning of Stephen. It wasn't revealed at the time when the Apostle Paul was converted on the road to Damascus. It wasn't revealed all the way up until the close of the book of Acts. There's no mention of it. It was revealed necessarily after that time. We talked earlier about in the book of Romans, the metaphor was the olive tree. The Gentiles grafted in against nature. Grafted in to an existing olive tree, partaking of the root and fatness thereof. If language is sufficient to communicate anything to us, the olive tree of Romans cannot be conflated with the one new man of Ephesians. Ephesians 2.16, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. One body. Where is that body? That body is seated in heavenly places. Let's read some more about this. Ephesians chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 15, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, 
far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. This description of this church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all, that's raised up with him, set with him in the heavenly places, at the right hand of God, far above all principality and power. The church of Ephesians is not awaiting a coming kingdom. It's not awaiting a heavenly calling that comes down and fills the earth. The church of Ephesians is seated with Christ already in the heavenly places. Let's go to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. Ephesians and Colossians are the two great epistles of the mystery that was revealed to the Apostle Paul during his prison ministry for us Gentiles. This happened after the close of the book of Acts. As we've seen in further examination of the epistles written during the book of Acts, will show that the hope of Israel, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to set up his kingdom, and those things that pertain to the new covenant were all in play during that time period and during that dispensation. But following the close of the book of Acts, following the dismissal of the Jews before God as a people, following them becoming loami, not my people, a new program was revealed. That's the mystery of Ephesians and Colossians. Ephesians, or Colossians 1, 21. And you, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you. Paul was given a dispensation to give to the Gentiles for the purpose of fulfilling the word of God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery. So this dispensation is the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now, but now, but now, after the close of the book of Acts, is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In Ephesians and Colossians, there's this wish that, that, that those receiving this epistle would understand what the hope is. In the Acts dispensation, in the Pentecostal dispensation that, that characterizes the book of Acts, there was no need for them to explain the hope. They all knew the hope. The hope was the coming kingdom. The hope was the second advent. The hope was the Messiah ruling and the nation of Israel above all the other nations to serve as the priest to all the other Gentile nations. A nation of kings and priests. So we see that there's a clear distinction, that there was a clear boundary crossed when the book of Acts closed and the mystery was revealed. Now, there will always be objections to this. Let's go to Romans chapter 16. For a gotcha verse. Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Now we read about a mystery in Romans chapter 16. Is that the same thing as the mystery in Ephesians and the mystery in Colossians? Well, this mystery 
is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God. This is a mystery that was hid in the scriptures, not a mystery that was hid in God. We have to distinguish these things. There's more than one mystery in the Bible. Christ talked about the mystery of the kingdom of heaven. The Apostle Paul in several places talks about mysteries that don't have anything to do with this one or the mystery that was revealed after the close of the book of Acts. His prison ministry uh, mystery which reveals the position and hope and calling of the church now without the nation of Israel, without the new covenant. Separate from being blessed with Abraham. Chosen before the foundation of the world in Christ. It is only the church of that mystery, not the mystery here in Romans 6, 16, for Romans 16, we read about, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God. Well, let's go to Romans 3 and see where we see this same language. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. We're talking about the mystery of Christ here. What he's talking about in Romans 3 is the same thing he's talking about in Romans 16. For in the whole of the book of Romans, we don't read anything about being seated with Christ in heavenly places. We don't read anything about a church whose calling is far above all. We don't read anything about Christ who is our hope shall appear in glory, then we shall also appear with him. We don't read anything of the sort. For the heavenly calling and heavenly nature of the church uh, that, is, that was revealed in the dispensation of the grace of God committed to Paul after Acts 28, In that, is not it was not revealed in the book of Romans. That mystery is not the mystery of Christ, that God was reconciling the world unto himself, or that in Christ, uh, that Christ is the righteousness without the law. Those things were hid in the scriptures. In types and shadows all throughout the scriptures, Christ's atoning sacrifice, the full sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice. All of the Old Testament prefigures that, but no one understood it at the time until it was revealed. That's why it could be witnessed by the, by the scripture of the prophets. So it's important to distinguish between different mysteries. The mystery of Romans 16.25 is, is not the mystery of Ephesians and Colossians. So let's continue. It's important then when we realize that God has dealt in different ways throughout time and with different people and with different means that the way that God is administering things now is not the way that he was administering things in Acts uh, all the way through the book. And so it stands to follow then that the epistles of Paul written during the time of, of the book of Acts and which have the characteristics of the Acts dispensation, those particular elements, those dispensational elements of those letters do not apply in a time where the nation of Israel is blinded, where salvation is sent unto the Gentiles apart from the nation of Israel, where the new covenant and all the promises that go along with it are on hold until God resumes his revealed program. So Galatians and Hebrews and 1st and 2nd Thessalonians and 1st and 2nd Corinthians and even the book of Romans in their dispensational aspects have things that we need to rightly divide and apply them to those people and those in that dispensation in which it existed. 
it's important. Let's go into the book of Romans chapter 1 and see an example of this. In Romans 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Again, the gospel is not the mystery. The fact that Jesus Christ, God incarnate, is the sole acceptable sacrifice for sin, that by placing your faith and trust in his cross work, what he accomplished when he died, was buried, and rose again on the cross, what he did for your sins, that's not the mystery. Because that was promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So while it was hid, and while it was kept secret, and it was revealed by the Apostle Paul, it was not something that was unsearchable. It's not an unsearchable mystery. The unsearchable riches of Christ our complete identification, not just with his death, burial, and resurrection, which would be good enough. But it goes further after the mystery was revealed. Where you go above all in the heavenly places, seated at the right hand of God the Father. That's the position. It's that identification that is something that is not revealed even in Romans. But, I continue... Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship, for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Again, this is the same... The beginning of Romans is very similar to the end of Romans in this obedience to all nations and the, his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, let's continue down here get to the point that I was trying to make. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Romans 1.16 For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. It's important to not skip over the import of that statement. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For a long time, I think, uh, I know that I was this way, and I think a lot of people just skip right over that. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. As if he was saying... You know, um, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, all that believeth, to the Americans first and also to the Chinese. But that's not what he's talking about. At the time of the writing of the book of Romans, the Jew held the preeminence in the plan of God. That's the revealed plan of God, whether we like it or not. The Jew is first. The nation of Israel is exalted above all other nations, but they are not in belief right now, and they have been cast aside, awaiting that time when they shall look upon him who they have pierced, and be converted. For it is not until the nation of Israel, the Jewish people as a whole, are converted that God's revealed program, which is consummated and detailed in the book of Revelation, can be completed. So you have what God has revealed, what God has promised, all of those things were contingent upon the repentance of Israel and their acceptance of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it didn't happen. So what happens? Is Are we just out of luck here? Far from it. That's where the mystery comes in. But notice that even in the book of Romans, the last book written during the Acts period, it's still to the Jew first. And so, it's important to recognize that there are dispensational differences. Now, the gospel is not a dispensational truth. Christ's all-sufficient sacrifice for sin is applicable to all dispensations. But the message, in particular, that Jesus Christ died for your sins, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, was revealed at a at a moment in time. 
everyone who was ever saved would have to be saved on the merits of that, of, of that sacrifice, of his cross work. But those in dispensations previously had no knowledge in particular of the specifics of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it was revealed in types and shadows. All of those things, the whole Levitical law, is type and shadow of the Lord Jesus Christ's sacrifice. It all points to him. That's not dispensational truth. Dispensational truth refers rather to the callings, the promises, the specific um, uh, consequences of the inheritance, these things, not the basis on which you receive them. It's important to make that distinction. But the nation of Israel being first, the second advent and the coming kingdom, signs and wonders, the constant appeal to Moses and the prophets, these things are distinguishing factors of the Acts dispensation. It's important. If you look at the amount of times that Paul quotes from the Old Testament, it's replete throughout the epistles written during the Acts period. It's not so replete in those written afterwards. Why? Because a new program had been revealed. Because through faith in the gospel, not only are you grafted in, to Israel, but you're seated with Christ in heavenly places. This is something that was not revealed. So if I sound like a broken record, it's important it's, it's to drive home the import of this division. So in summary, prior to the close of the book of Acts, prior to Israel becoming Loamai, Let's, to, to understand what I mean by that, let's go to the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 1. This is the only occurrence of this phrase, but it is useful um, in its prophetical import to the time that we're living in. Hosea 1 or, uh, chapter 1, verse 9. Then said God, Call his name Loamai, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. Remember when we read in Jeremiah 31 about they will be my people and I will be their God. Well, if the Jews are Loamai, if the nation of Israel is Loamai, then they are not his people, and he will not be their God. So as long as that is true, as long as the Jews are dismissed, as long as God is not dealing with them, the new covenant cannot be in effect. If the new covenant is not in effect, all the promises and hopes that go along with it are necessarily suspended. That's why the mystery was ushered in and revealed to the Apostle Paul. And how much greater is it to be to have a heavenly hope than to have, a, than to have the kingdom hope? Greater things. We ought to be thankful to God for providing us Gentiles this access. This is something that was never prophesied, that the salvation of God through the, through the gospel would be sent to all nations without um, prejudice, without uh, distinction. And that right now God is building a church, the body of Christ, uniquely, completely identified with the risen and exalted Lord Jesus Christ. And so that when God looks upon a member of the body of Christ, he doesn't see a lost Gentile sinner. He doesn't see uh, impurity. And he doesn't look upon in judgment. But he sees his son, not only in his death on the cross, not only in his burial, not only in his resurrection unto new life, 
but also in his ascension into the heavenly places where God is, far above all principality and power. That's where members of the Church of the Body of Christ are today. That's their standing. Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter. The nation of Israel that exists today is not the fulfillment of the New Covenant. They are unbelieving, and they are not his people. Today, thanks to the mystery program revealed to the Apostle Paul, which you can read about in the book of Ephesians and the book of Colossians specifically, but in the other prison epistles as well, speak of the distinctives of, distinctives of this dispensation. We're blessed with all spiritual blessings. Not blessed with faithful Abraham in a city that has foundations that comes down from heaven and goes to the earth but rather we're blessed with Christ in heavenly places with all spiritual blessings. And if they're all spiritual, then they won't be in part physical. This is the mystery. And this is what the Church, which is the body of Christ, so uniquely identified with him is ascension and exaltation, is able to experience and to rejoice in. I think I've gone on too long. But I hope that we've demonstrated today that the book of Acts contains in it not a transition from one dispensation to another, but rather the information and the history of the nation of Israel as they repeatedly rejected the Holy Ghost and the testimony of the apostles, and they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that, they are not his people. They are not enjoying the promises made unto them. God did not gather them together and place them in the land, which he will do. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. But the mystery, the dispensation of the grace of God was revealed. And so today, without the ordinances of Israel, without the signs and wonders of Israel, without the fulfillment of the new covenant, without the Davidic kingdom, without any of the things that go along with the hope of Israel, we can have all spiritual blessings in Christ by faith in what he's done for us. Lost Gentile sinners who were completely strangers from the program of God and complete aliens from the covenants can be made one with the very Lord himself in heaven by trusting in what he's done on the cross. His death, burial, and resurrection. And if you place your faith in that and you can grasp the fellowship of the mystery that Jew and Gentile alike in a joint body without the nation of Israel but yet united to the great King and Lord Jesus Christ. I hope this message has been helpful. I'm going to link a PowerPoint presentation that I've uh, prepared, that I was consulting and attempting to read during this message. And uh, I'm also going to link an article with a brief uh, primer on the Acts 28 position. But I think when you grasp the import of this, it will help clear up lots of questions in the Bible and lots of difficulties and seeming contradictions. Uh, God bless you and thank you.